I've never seen anything in the national news before about local politics in rural eastern Tennessee. But independent congressional candidate Rick Tyler of rural eastern Tennessee managed to get his face all over the national news a few days ago. You may have seen a story about his brilliant idea for a campaign slogan. Yes, Mr. Tyler wants to make America white again. He has admitted to borrowing the idea for his slogan from another politician running this year. I'm sure Tyler wants to make America great again, too. He is just a tiny bit more blatant about the method he believes is necessary for that to happen than is Donald Trump. Mr. Tyler's theory is obviously that the original cause of America's past greatness was that white people were firmly and totally in control of the leadership in the land. For surely he couldn't really believe that there was any time in American history when everyone in the land was white. People of color had been brought to the colonies since long before the U.S. became the U.S. By 1789, there were about three-fourths of a million Negroes in the country. By the time of the Civil War, they had reproduced so prolifically that there were 4.4 million in the country. And by the time this picture was taken, the number of African Americans in the land had almost doubled and was approaching 9 million, with no slowing down in sight. By the beginning of the 1950s, there were 15 million African Americans in the country. No, America has never been all white, so Tyler must be referring to returning to the circumstances of a time when white citizens had an unquestionable, comfortable majority over the number of non-white citizens and wield unquestioned power over all others. But Tyler is quick to explain that his theory has nothing to do with racism. As he put it to reporters, he just wants America to go back to a 1960s, Ozzy and Harriet, leave it to beaver time, when there were no break-ins, no violent crime, no mass immigration. Well, well, this certainly pins down just when he believed America was great and white, very, very white. That would be in the 1950s and 60s. Yes, Tyler wants to go back to a time when everyone knew America was white, because that's all they saw on their favorite television shows, such as The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. White people. Very white people. Mr. Tyler's family in rural eastern Tennessee in that era no doubt invited the Nelson family into their living room every week and savored their adventures, which never ever included any break-ins or violent crime. And anytime he wants to remember that era, he can go back and watch reruns of the Nelson's adventures on a nostalgia cable network or buy DVDs of the whole series and savor the simplicity of all their little family adventures. And if Mr. Tyler ever had any doubts about his fading memories of what the 1950s and 60s era was really like, he could also tune in to that Nostalgia TV channel or buy a whole collection of the episodes of his other wistful favorite, Leave it to Beaver. That will reassure him that indeed the era was whiter than white and full of young people who had gentle little adventures and minor little road bumps in growing through the preteen and teen years.
The old black and white Nelson and Cleaver shows were pretty much relegated to obscure rerun channels by the 1970s. But the youth in the generation of the 1970s and 80s could get their own taste of what those great American days were like for young people by watching a freshly made nostalgia show. Just like the Nelson and Cleaver shows, this one was whiter than white too, with gentle little preteen and teen adventures and minor little adolescent dating problems and such, focusing on squeaky clean Richie Cunningham and his younger sister Joni. The edgiest part of the show was the addition of a leather jacketed friend for Richie. But Arthur, the Fonz, Fonzarelli was a marshmallow version of a tough guy, who was gentlemanly to girls, very polite to adults, and smiled way more than he frowned. Yes, Mr. Rick Tyler of rural eastern Tennessee is sure all our American problems would be taken care of if we could somehow become a white America again and return to the Ozzie and Harriet style happy days of no break-ins and no violent crime. So let's see. The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet were first broadcast in 1952. The same year this headline was published in the New York Times. The accompanying article reflects the deep concern spreading across the country about a continuing sharp increase from year to year in the statistics of crimes, including burglaries and violent crimes perpetrated by teenagers in America. In fact, by 1954, there were actually televised hearings of a special congressional committee formed to study this troubling trend, which was widespread not just in inner cities, but among teens from white, middle-class families in the suburbs, families like the fictional Cleavers and Nelsons. And the troubled youth were trending younger and younger. The situation continued on through the 1950s into the 1960s. Actually, though, the juvenile delinquency problem had been growing since the late 1940s and was emphasized widely in books and media, such as this novel from 1949. And this sociological study from 1962. And another sociological study from 1964. You'll note that those two sociological studies were from the heyday of both Leave it to Beaver and Ozzie and Harriet. But where the teen crime problem really became obvious was on the silver screen every weekend, starting very early in the 1950s, launched in particular by one of the most famous motion pictures of that era.
Mr. Tyler was obviously ridiculously incorrect in his assertion that there were no burglaries and violent crimes back when Ozzy and Harriet and family were on TV. Is Mr. Tyler just a complete liar? I kind of doubt it. I'm suspicious that this is his problem. I think he has his own set of rose-colored nostalgia glasses that he puts on whenever he considers the past of his youth. He remembers what he wants to remember, forgets what he wants to forget, and likely has no clue about many events and conditions that were prevalent back when he was a young lad outside his own little neighborhood. He just remembers all the childhood fun. Unfortunately, a lot of people who aren't particularly racist share Mr. Tyler's vision problem. They may not wish for a whiter America now, but they definitely have forgotten or never knew what life was like for a significant proportion of the population in those happy days of the 50s and early 60s. They also think that America was for sure a great place to live then and wish we could somehow resurrect the way of life they remember. I don't doubt that many are also affected by looking at old Saturday Evening Post covers by Norman Rockwell that romanticize the gentle cheerfulness they remember of those days. What many don't realize, though, is that Norman Rockwell himself, after he left the employment of the Post magazine, embarked on a much different path of illustration. His contract with Post had prevented him from exploring darker topics that were on his heart. But in 1963, he shifted over to doing work for Look magazine, which gave him free reign to follow his heart. And he did, starting with this major painting that was featured as a two-page spread in Look in January 1964. It was titled, the problem we all live with, and depicted a slice of history from four years earlier in 1960, when six-year-old Ruby Bridges became a guinea pig for efforts to integrate the white segregated grade school in her neighborhood in New Orleans. had to daily be protected by federal marshals as she entered the school building, passing in front of a screaming crowd of rabid segregationists. Yes, they hurled curses, spit at, and even threatened death for this little girl who was unaware that America would be so much greater if it stayed white. Late in 1964, Norman Rockwell got even edgier in a dramatic scene he painted for another look issue. Called Southern Justice, it depicts an event that made headlines earlier in the year. Three civil rights workers who had come to Mississippi to help with voter registration were kidnapped and killed by the KKK, aided by local law enforcement. No violent crime in the 1960s, Mr. Tyler? Sorry, history tells a quite different story. The illusion of Rick Tyler's Great White America was particularly evident in the most popular reading textbooks of the 1950s, Dick and Jane. By some estimates, 80% of first graders in the U.S. in 1950 all learned to read from the same gentle little stories about Dick and Jane and their happy playtimes and happy playmates and happy visits to happy places. Those stories may have indeed reflected much in the daily lives of many of those children.
That would have included their happy playtimes on pleasant playgrounds. But not every child who lived in the Ozzie and Harriet years had those happy playground memories. Millions would have just been able to watch the fun through the chain link fences, protecting that whiter than white world from their presence. Lots of folks from that era also have happy memories of lazy days at the beach, enjoying the sun and surf. But not everyone in that happy days world had as much fun at the beach. A popular magazine among many older folks in America these days is titled Reminisce. It specializes in inviting readers to share their own photos of their youth in the 1930s through the 1970s. A big share of the Reminisce reading audience these days consists of baby boomers and thus many photos are from the Ozzie and Harriet era. After a while, you begin to notice how distinctly white almost all the pictures are. Why wouldn't African Americans have photo memories of happy days at the drive-ins and diners, for instance? Perhaps because a significant percentage of those places in that great American era were off limits to people of color. Many simple pleasures and conveniences of that era were inaccessible to a significant portion of the American population, including even something as simple as getting an ice-cold Coca-Cola from a vending machine in many parts of the country. I'm a child of the 50s myself. I have some happy memories of my youth, some things I'm nostalgic for, but I am painfully aware that the privileges of my youth were unavailable to large numbers of American citizens merely because of the color of their skin. That saddens and disturbs me. And to think that men aspiring to lead this country into the future are ignorant and thoughtless enough to ignore the ignominious parts of that past disturbs me even more. There is nothing wrong with reminiscing about your youth, but to whitewash with a broad brush parts of the past that were brutal at worst and unjust at best and claim for a deeply flawed era some sort of unblemished greatness that it didn't have is foolish at best and deceptive at worst. We don't need to try to make America great again by returning to some illusion about our past. We just need to decide once and for all if we really want what the U.S. Pledge claims, liberty and justice for all. Finally accomplishing that would yield a great America. I suggest we smile back at the fictional Cleaver Boys as we wave goodbye to their fictional America and let go of our illusions. We need to get back to the future where we can actually build a better world for our children and grandchildren by making better, wiser, kinder, more compassionate, more just choices than were made in all of our past eras.